Good morning. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord on this rainy day? Amen. Will you stand with me as we sing our call to worship? Sing hallelujah. Two times. Sing hallelujah to the God is good, all the time. and all the time, God is good. even when it is rainy and cold outside, He's still good. Uh, we have uh, quite a few announcements today, so please pay attention because chances are one of these applies to you. Uh, don't forget, first of all, this applies to everyone, to spring forward next Sunday. It's already that time of year, so this is uh, not the time where we get extra sleep, but where we lose just a little bit of it. So please uh, make sure that's set so you show up to church on time. If you show up uh, a little bit later, we'll be finishing up, and, and we'll just say hello to you as we head to lunch. <laughs> uh, Lent starts this Wednesday. Uh, our 40 Days of Lent devotional are available, hard copy at the doors. Uh, the current Lent readings go through March 16th. And you can also see the readings daily on uh, ph.church, uh, that website, and it's starting the first day of Lent. Uh, tonight, choir practice will be meeting at, at 5 p.m. And on Wednesday night, or excuse me, on Wednesday, the nitwits will meet at Red Lobster at 11 a.m. instead of noon. So if you are a nitwit, then uh, make sure you go to Red Lobster at 11 instead of noon. <laughs> we have quite a few confessing that this morning. Uh, the fundraising committee will meet at 7.15 uh, on, on Wednesday in Skip's class. General announcements are that for, for good, choir practice is changing to 5 p.m. Uh, starting March 3rd. And if, uh, if you are interested in joining the choir, we still have some room up there. So if we've got some singers out there that would like to contribute your voice in that way, you will be welcome. Uh, the Martins benefit tickets are on sale now. See Kathy Everett, uh, Sheila Rhodes, or Paige Hines, and uh, they will, will get you what you need. This is uh, the announcement that I was instructed uh, two persons removed to be, be firm on. So uh, I, I told the early service, firm is not, not my best uh, way of being. I usually save that for my daughters when they're acting up before bed. So just imagine me saying this in a firm way because I don't know that I can manage it. But safe sanctuary training is March 17th from 3 to 4 p.m. in the Family Life Center. Anyone working with children and youth in any way need to attend. And this is the part that is written in red that is uh, the firm part. So again, imagine me saying this in a firm way. If you miss the training, you underline will not be able to get through the doors without an escort. So that is, that is the message there. Safe sanctuary training is very important and it's important for our kids. So please, if you work with the children, uh, uh, go to that training. For the children's department, yes. Okay, Renee, Renee clarified that uh, not the doors of the church, the, the doors of the, the, the children and youth. So if that wasn't clear, I better make that announcement next Sunday. They're going to think they can't come to church. <laughs> the children's department announcements, please don't forget to bring in donations to help the homeless. Signs are posted with needed items and are also included in the bulletin. 
The Spring Shopping Bazaar will be April 13th in conjunction with an Easter egg hunt. Watch for more information. Also, t-shirt sales start to help the kids with activities and missions. Uh, order forms are in the bulletin. See uh, Dana or Amanda uh, to order those. And for the youth announcements, March 10th, the youth will go to see the Tim Tebow movie. Uh, they've, they've talked that out a little bit this morning. And if you're interested in that, please uh, contact Brian or Angela. And also, youth tonight is uh, canceled. They will not be meeting. For the ladies, do not forget to make contact with your secret sister monthly. And don't forget her special days and holidays. And for the men... Uh, men's breakfast will be in the Family Life Center on Saturday morning, March 30th at 7.30 a.m. Did I, did I miss any announcements? I was telling the truth when I said one probably applied to you, wasn't I? There's, there's quite a few there. If there aren't, uh, let's move forward and continue to worship with our praises and our concerns. So if you have a praise or a concern today, uh, please uh, share it with us if you feel it's appropriate. Heather is still doing well. She's, she got a good report Thursday, uh, Friday that she's still making improvement. Uh, she will be having surgery Thursday to correct their aneurysm. Okay. So continue to remember her in prayer. All right, let's keep praying for Heather. All right, let's let's lift Kona up. Say say that one more time, Larry. Ed Ingram's family. Lena Hale, who fell yesterday, and uh, she's she's uh, struggling some. She's in the hospital. They expect her to come home tomorrow. I understand, but still, it's it's a little bit scary for all involved. And Grace, uh, continue to pray for her. Uh, she seems to be doing much better, though. All right. Let's pray for Clinton Beth's son and, and maybe even Clinton Beth a little bit as they uh, pray for him. Johnny Cook, yes. Jane and her mother. Yes, praise for the outcome of uh, this past week. Well, we will be praying for you, Susan, for good results. All right. Well, we'll pray for you on Friday, Mary. All right. We, we need a prayer calendar. <laughs> we need... All right. <laughs> yeah. For those of us who are healthy right now, we definitely praise God. Betty Phillips. Yes. There are a lot of things that we don't... Uh, lift up all the time uh, and and there's good reason for it it's those are those things that we don't necessarily want to be everyone's business maybe even things that not everyone would agree on that needs prayer in a certain direction so uh, I want to give opportunity for people in our services to lift those things up to God those things that are on our hearts that were not appropriate to share out loud or we didn't feel moved to do so just uh, if you have one of those just raise your hand and understand that God knows your heart. Let's bow our heads. Father, uh, we are here in this place today, all of us, because we're seeking you uh, from a place of imperfection, 
from a place where we are trying to, to understand more of life and what you want for us and, and how you want us to get it, how you want us to operate in the world, how you want us to love better, to give grace and to experience it more. And we believe that through uh, this, we get a little bit closer by praying our prayers, by singing our songs, by having communion, by listening to a sermon, by doing all these different things that we have a chance to know you more, to experience more of who you are. And so, Lord, we ask that you would take our efforts today and use them uh, for us to be closer to you. We ask this because we believe you're eager to do it. But, Lord, uh, apart from this moment and this place now, there are many different situations that we believe are not the way they will be when your kingdom comes in its fullness. There's still lots of hurt. There is pain and sorrow and perspective that keeps us from recognizing who you are and what you want for us. And so, Lord, what we ask is that your presence would be with all of those. We understand that in some of those situations, that it seems as if the only answer is a miracle for you to move and a potent way where it's obvious you've worked. But Lord, there are other situations that require those miracles that seem a little less miraculous. Those things that aren't obvious and that could be doubted by those who, who don't see your hand at work. And, and we pray for those as well, that you would change our perspectives, that you'd give us your comfort and your peace, that you'd walk with us as we mourn for the different things that have happened in our lives that are happening and, and possibly could happen. Be with us, Lord, and give us that comfort. Lord, we are asking, above all, for your presence and your guidance. And we trust that you'll give it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Will you stand with me as we sing Victory in Jesus?
please remain standing as we affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now just take a few moments to uh, greet your neighbor. I thought we were going to have a, uh, an anthem. No, we don't have a special today. Okay. I was ready to, they were going to make me sing by myself, I guess. But <laughs> greet, greet one another and also know that we have um, a singing coming up March 31st that we're going to play just a little advertisement for. So pay attention to that as you greet.
before I get started preaching, uh, Jerry reminded me of something that I, I uh, often will forget in the midst of preaching a sermon and getting ready for communion, and that is that we take up a benevolence offering uh, each, each time we do have communion. And one thing that might be worth, worth noting uh, is that um, for whatever reason, this, this month, this past month, there have been quite a few requests for, for help in a number of different ways. And this, this offering goes to helping people with, with utilities usually is the primary thing that we help folks with. But if you feel moved, uh, I'll just let you know that that fund is running a little low right now because of the number of people who have needed help recently. And Jerry has uh, rightfully reminded me, and I'm saying it now because a sermon <laughs> is enough to make me forget in a good way, right? <laughs> Because it's going to be so engaging, right, Jerry? Yes. All right. <laughs> today, today we are talking about Matthew chapter five, verses fourteen through sixteen. And if you were paying attention last week, you you understand that this was one of the scriptures that was within the larger uh, scripture that we read last week. It's from the Sermon on the Mount. It's Jesus talking about us in the larger context. It relates to the law and how we relate to the world. But I just want to go deeper into one specific idea in this context uh, right now. And so in Matthew chapter 5, in these verses, we see Jesus saying, you, and I do want to reiterate, when he says you, uh, y'all, we are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden and then he goes on and he says in the next verse, Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. When I learned this as a kid in the song, it was a bushel basket. And you know that song about, anyway, won't let Satan blow it out, all those things. Well, under a basket, but puts that lamp on a stand and it gives light to all those in the house. And so this sermon is for those people who have their lamp lit. And I, I, I know you, I don't know your, your hearts completely, but I feel like I get a glimpse in it, of it in the way that you talk to one another, the way you treat one another, the things that you do in life. And I believe your lamps are, are lit. I believe that you are the light of the world. I believe that you do make a difference. But this verse says that there are times where we can have that lamp lit, but we place our lamp under a bushel basket uh, that we put something over it, that we, we are the light of the world, and yet the world doesn't get a chance to see that for one reason or another. And today, specifically, I want to talk about one way that I believe we do this in multiple ways, and each of us have our own ways of doing that. But just one thought before we go forward in what constitutes a bushel basket. First of all, uh, nothing is wrong with a basket. Uh, it, it has a function. It does good. It's something that you should have around, right? It's not a bad thing in and of itself. It's just when it's placed over this lamp that it becomes a problem. I could see myself having a basket in my house. I might not be using it for the same thing that maybe they were using it for at that time, putting olives or grapes in. In our house with four kids, it'd probably be holding clean, unfolded laundry <laughs> or, uh, or something of that nature. Maybe some toys to get out of the way so that we can clean up the living room real quick. But we could use it for good purposes. It's, it's when it's used for the bad. So keep in mind that a bushel basket in our lives is not necessarily a terrible thing to have around. It's just that when it begins to block our light from, from being shown into the world, that it becomes a problem. So what is, what is it that uh, could be a negative bushel basket for us? I heard a story that may help you to understand where I'm going this week, and it was about a man named John Sharp, and he is uh, a teacher. And I, I think having lived with a teacher for... Uh, as many years as I've been married, which is 13 now, and then my mother was uh, uh, an early childhood uh, development teacher at Handy Head Start. So I got to see firsthand how exhausting being a teacher can be. You are trying to teach kids, and sometimes they're receptive, sometimes they aren't. And I've seen teachers come home firsthand and just not feel like, like doing anything. They are, are spent. And I almost expect to hear an amen when I uh, I, I say that for those of you who are teachers in the congregation, but it can be tough. And, and this man, John Sharp, 
decided he needed something in his life other than just family, other than just his job, and so he got a wood shop. And in this wood shop, it wasn't huge. You know, it was just a little, little spot set aside. And uh, he, he had some nice tools, though. He had a saw. He had drills. He had all the things that you need in a wood shop that I, I don't really know about. And he would begin to, to use this. He made a bench. He did a few other things. And he was making some progress. He was getting fairly proficient in it. And one of the things that, that you may or may not know is that you can figure out just about how to do anything on YouTube now. There are instructional videos for just about everything you can imagine. And so he, he would watch videos of how to work in his wood shop, how to make doors, how to do all the things that he'd like to do and the improvements he'd like to make on his house. And so what would often happen, he'd come home from school exhausted and think about a, a project he'd want to do. I believe one that really uh, intrigued him was a barn door, somehow using that to decorate his house. He probably saw Chip and Joanna Gaines do it or something like that. But the, he, he saw this, and so he wanted to see the different ways of doing that. And when you, when you search for that on YouTube, the list is huge of the number of different ways that you can do this to uh, customize barn doors for your, for your home. And what he realized was, was a trend for him, was that he would get home, and he wanted to do something that was good. You know, he can give these things as gifts. He could make his house a better place. He could help somebody else who maybe can't do this for themselves. There's lots of good that can come from working in a wood shop. But what he found is he would get on YouTube and watch these instructional videos, and then he'd say, well, let's see how this other person does it. And he'd watch another video, and watch another video, and watch another video, and he'd watch these people make these doors, and he said usually around 45 minutes in, he realizes, I am beginning to waste my time. I'm not getting a, a barn door built. I am, am just watching other people live their lives. I'm living vicariously through them. And that, for him, became a bushel basket. He had this great workshop, but he never used it because he was always watching other people do something else. And, and I think all of us have these different ways that, that we live vicariously through other people, and it, it kind of tricks us into feeling as if we are living a good life when really we're just watching other people live. Now, there's, there's all sorts of different ways that this happens. There's do-it-yourself videos. There's uh, cooking shows. Uh, there are video games, and some of you may not know this. Some of you who are younger may, but there is even a market on YouTube. People make a living playing video games, taking videos of those, and letting other people watch those, and they make uh, good money doing that because people want to see how good they play these different video games, and there's something in us that wants to watch other people because we get to experience a taste of the emotions that they're experiencing without paying the price for doing it. Uh, it's nice to be able to watch something make something beautiful when you don't have to really put the work in to make it happen. And uh, this happens to us all the time. Yours might be something else. It might be watching the news. That might be your basket. It might be watching movies. It might be listening to music. It, it could be any number of things, but it, it gets into a, a, an even more troublesome place when it's not just about evoking these emotions in ourselves through movies or TV shows or do-it-yourself videos, but when we start to use them to feel better about ourselves as human beings, to watch people being virtuous so that we feel virtuous. Now, there are all kinds of things out there now. If you can imagine something that is videoed and people are making money off of it, then uh, it's probably out there already. And one of those that I was introduced to this week and just heard about it for the first time was that they're mostly women uh, make videos of their bedtime routine. So they talk about what they do after they get home from work, about the kind of house shoes that they put on, about the kind of, of uh, food that they cook. They talk about the different mud masks they use. They talk about what they put in their baths as bath bombs. They talk about all these different things. And there's a huge market of people who watch these. And most of these folks who are watching these are folks who just don't happen to have 
the energy to do the things that they're watching, to get that good night's sleep, to have that great evening, but they get a little bit of a taste of it by watching other people. They get to live vicariously through them, and they get to feel as if they good, have good habits when they really don't. We trick ourselves into living someone else's life. We put our light under a bushel basket. And it's not just that kind of virtue of having good habits, but I know you, you probably remember the show Extreme Home Makeover. Does anybody remember that show where they would go in and usually it's a family who is doing a great work in the community and their own family. They're just good people, but their home is not up to the level of the kind of character that they have. And so the people on that show go in and they sometimes it seems as if they tear down their whole house and rebuild them a new one and then they have a big reveal and then the family gets to enjoy this big huge house and it makes you feel good to see these these tv shows doesn't it because you know someone is is living a better life you're inspired you get to see how things are changed for someone but but the thing that that we don't want to think about is that watching a hundred episodes of extreme home makeover is not as good as going down the road and mowing a widow's lawn (laughs) once. Does that make sense? Uh, But we spend so much time watching and consuming the good things that other people are doing that we forget that we have our own life to live. We have a lamp that needs to be shown, that you are salt and light of the world. And without you, this world is going to be a worse place. Without you doing the things that you're capable of doing, if you get caught up in living someone else's life through the news, through, through TV, through Facebook, through whatever it is, this world is not, is not as good a place as it would have been if you were to get out there and just do something. Now, there's, there's a reason that sometimes we feel this. Uh, there's a, a gentleman named Ed O'Brien, and again, I was introduced to him this, this week, and he did some research uh, from University of Chicago about why it is we're drawn to these videos so much. And part of it is that we feel as if we can do what these folks who are in these videos can do. So if you watch Bob Ross, does anybody remember Bob Ross? He's not with us anymore, but the guy, the painter with the big afro, and he was so positive, he'd say things like happy little trees and anyone can paint, you know, those sorts of things. You watch enough Bob Ross, you start to think you can paint. And it's not, and and that's proven that if you watch enough videos without picking up a paintbrush, you will fool yourself into thinking you can paint. And one of the experiments that that this uh, gentleman did was he had his subjects watch videos of people moonwalking, instructional videos. Does, do you all know what moonwalking is? I, I can't demonstrate it. It's what Michael Jackson used to do. <laughs> it's, it's harder than it sounds, which is kind of the point. But you kind of place one foot back and you push and see, I, I can't do it, but you walk backwards and it looks pretty cool. It goes along with the music. But they had these subjects watch these videos For some of them, they had them just watch it once, and then others, they had them watch the videos about 15 or 16 times without without trying, uh, actually, to do it. And what they found was the people who watched it enough started thinking that they could moonwalk even when they didn't. You can hear the recording of, of what they say about the moonwalking before it happens, and they, they're telling everybody that they had a panel of judges that were going to judge them to put some, some, uh, a little bit of skin in the game. But uh, they, they were telling the judges, yeah, I'm going to kill this, I'm going to do great. And as soon as they start, they realize how hard moonwalking is, that you can't just watch somebody do it and expect to be able to do it yourself. And so why do I, why do I say all these things? And, and it's to get to this point that I think for us as Christians, we can get in such a consumer mentality. The, the idea that we take in things enough, we'll be good Christians. And, and there's some truth to that. It's, it's good to hear good sermons. It's good to read your Bible. It's good to have devotionals. It's good to do all the things that we do. But again, in the same way that those folks were watching the moonwalk videos, you can listen to the best preachers in the world over and over and over again, 
And until you try to live out the things that they're talking about, we're really just being consumers. We're just listening. We're just feeling good about ourselves until we actually do the things that those preachers, those books, those different things that we're consuming are telling us to do. Action is necessary. And until it happens, it is as if we have lit a lamp. We can feel good about ourselves. We can experience these emotions. We can feel as if our life is going the way it ought to be. But until we actually start to try those things, we don't make a difference. And we also are often fooling ourselves into thinking we've, we've become a better person than we actually are. And that's, that's a tragedy because you have the ability to take this action, to change, to make a difference in the world. And when you do, things get better, not just for you, but for everyone. Just a, a couple scriptures to highlight this. James chapter 2, verse 19 says, You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. In other words, you can come to church, you can say you believe, you can listen to all the sermons you want, you can do all the devotionals you want, you can do all these things which are good, and I would even say necessary. But if that's all you do, you get to a point where you're just believing and not being a, a light to the world. I believe in prayer. I believe in the power of it. But if somebody is experiencing hardship in their life, and all you ever do for anyone is say, I'm going to give you thoughts and prayers. Is that, is that really doing anything? Is that really being light to the world? Again, prayers are, are wonderful. I love praying. I love seeing things happen through prayer. But that cannot be the only thing. Uh, next in Luke chapter 6, verse uh, 43 through 45, we have Jesus make some pretty strong statements about What's, what's going on in our hearts? Even though we might feel good about ourselves based on the things we've consumed, the things we've watched, the things we've read, Jesus says, For no good tree bears bad fruit, nor again does a bad tree bear good fruit. For each tree is known by its own fruit, for figs are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor are grapes picked from a bramble bush. The good person, out of the good treasure of his heart, produces good, and the evil person, out of his evil treasure, produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. There, there has to be some, some action with, with what is in our heart. We have to do something. Uh, we have to produce some fruit. If we want to prove to ourselves, to prove to others that, that we're making a difference, that we're being light to the world, there has to be something that goes along with it. Not just receiving the good things that other people have, have been doing, but doing some good of our own. Now, again, just to reiterate the passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all the house. So, Put, put your lamp out where people can see it. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And so, so what would it look like? There's a couple things that would change. Uh, it would mean there'd be less time with TV, less time on the Internet, less time with whatever it is that you're, is your preferred basket. And we all have them. I mean, there's, there's no denying it that all of us have ways that we, we kind of live through other people. Reading can be that. Just because it's a book doesn't mean it's something you should be doing all the time. Uh, we all have our ways. Watching the news can be it. How, how many times can you see the update on investigations that are going on in one day and, uh, and still feel as if you're living life and not living through someone else. Uh, all of us have these things. All of us have these baskets. Let's set them aside and let our light shine. And what would that, that be like? Well, if we just take a moment to think about how things would be different at Pleasant Hill. Now, I'm saying this knowing 
that already there are plenty of y'all who are letting your light shine. So please don't let this come across as me saying that everyone here is just living life under a basket. But what I am saying is that there may be some of us who are, maybe even some of us who are more than others. And what would happen if we removed these baskets and just let shine what was already there? Apply what you already have to offer, connect with people in a way that, that matters. Uh, I think there are a couple of things that would come, come up at Pleasant Hill. One would be that there'd probably be more preachers called into ministry. Uh, that would probably be the case. There'd be more people coming up and, and trying to make a difference in that way. There'd probably be more students of the Bible, more Sunday school teachers. There'd probably be more volunteers for the youth. What would it be like if people were just looking for ways to let their light shine? What would it be like if we were going to Brian and Angela and saying, you know what, I don't know what I can do for the youth, but just let me know what I can do. Show me some way that I can help. What would it be like if we did that for the children? What would it be like if we, we went to, to Jerry and said, Jerry, I know there's somebody who's, who's called you recently who's struggled with their utilities. Maybe they're even disabled. Uh, could you, you feel like it'd be appropriate to give me their contact information? I could mow their lawn. I could talk with them. I could visit with them. I could be light to them. What would it be like if we turned off whatever bushel that we have chosen for ourselves and went and did some of these things that, that we're watching? And I think that, that it's obvious all of us would enjoy it, that our lives would be better. We'd be better off. We'd make a difference, and it would certainly impact those people around us. But one thing that I do want to say is that I know that there are times to rest. There are some times you've had a hard work week. Maybe you do need a day to just veg out <laughs> and consume rather than, than produce. In fact, the Bible has something to say about that, right? <laughs> that there are times that we need to take off and take care of ourselves but you have to figure this out on your own. There are different people with different abilities, different uh, ways of being in the world, and different people are exhausted more by getting out in the world and, and letting their basket open. And other people uh, feel like they, they don't ever want to put a basket over their light at all. Uh, they have a trouble in the opposite direction. But you have to figure it out on your own. And maybe one of the prime examples of that is, is Facebook. Now, if I get tired... And Facebook, some of y'all can relate to this. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands who's on Facebook or not. But uh, for me, sometimes I can get on Facebook and on my phone, if I get tired, my, my thumb seems to have a mind of its own or my forefinger and I just keep scrolling. I just keep on scrolling to see what comes next. It's almost like I've gotten in this haze and I keep going and I might come across a video that I might want to watch, but if it's more than a minute long, I realize my attention span isn't, isn't even good enough for that and I keep going and it's just a destructive thing. It's, it's not positive. But Facebook can be very good sometimes. Uh, I've had situations where uh, I feel like I've gotten a word from someone else that is encouraging to me. I've been able to give it to someone else. And the difference for me often comes down to this, that when I'm healthy and I'm doing Facebook in the right way, I'm commenting on other people's posts. I'm making my own post. I'm talking to someone else in a positive way to say, congratulations, you did a great job, or thank you for sharing this, or thank you for what you did for me earlier this week, or some sort of positive interaction. When it's the worst, when I feel like it's actually a bushel basket, is when it becomes just an autopilot, where you just keep going and keep going. But if you can interact with people in a positive way, I feel like it can be a lamp set on a table so everyone can see it. And so, again, the point that I'm trying to make in that is that we, we live by the Spirit and not by the law. You've got to figure out what is the right space for yourself. When are you getting to a place where you're hiding your light under a basket? And when are you being healthy? And the truth is, nobody can answer that but you and God. But it's a question that really ought to be asked. Father, what is it that I should be doing? Am I consuming too much? Is it time for me to start producing and making a difference in the people's lives around me? And I guarantee you, 
if you begin to ask that question and ask God, how can I make more of a difference? People will come to mind, situations will come to mind, and he will show you a path forward where you can make a difference. Let's bow our heads. Uh, Father, we are here in this moment. We are eager for your presence. So we ask that you'd meet us in this moment so that we can know more of how you're calling us to be light to the world. Lord, help us to set aside the baskets that we've made for ourselves, uh, ways that we live for, through other people, and to live the life that you have for us. And we ask for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, today, we are celebrating the Lord's Supper. We know that Jesus prayed, right? We know that he, he was a devout man of prayer. We even remember that he prayed so hard on the night he gave himself up for us that he sweat blood. And that's, that's an intense prayer. That's, that's more intense than anything I've ever done. But Jesus knew that just the prayer wasn't enough, that there had to be some action taken with this for his mission on earth to be accomplished. And we had a, a foretaste of that on the night before he went to the cross. He tried to explain to his disciples some of what that would mean for them, and what it would mean for us. And he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. That through his sacrifice, we were going to have a chance to know God in a way that we did not know before. Then he took the wine and he said, this is my blood, which is shed for you. This is the blood of the new covenant. God is, the blood as we celebrated it before was the blood of the lamb. Now he says it's his blood. And through this, we no longer have to live through the law, but we live through the spirit that Christ dwells within us. That uh, we don't have to go through someone else to experience God. Another way to put it, is you don't have to consume something from someone else to reach out to God, to know Him in your heart, to receive His presence. And He's done that for us through His blood. He washed us clean. And so today, it's our prayer, Father, that you would let this, this bread be your son's body and you'd let this grape juice be your son's blood. And that through this moment, we would remember him and be drawn deeper into his grace. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now I'd ask for those who are helping with communion to come forward, whether it's through music or uh, an usher or whatever your role might be. And one thing that I'd like to reiterate.